Thank you. Uh, so good evening. Uh, I am going to do an unusual thing for a Microsoft person. I'm going to use no PowerPoint. Right? So we'll see how this goes as I make it up as I go along. Uh, I want to talk about innovation. Innovation is a great word. This is a word that, uh, as our US uh, cousins would say, is like motherhood and apple pie. What's not to like? Right? You know how many organizations say we're innovative, but are you really? Seth Godin said at one point, when you decide to innovate, where do you put the fear? Right? Why is it we love talking about innovation, but we're not so good at doing it? You can look at study after study of businesses that fail to innovate and literally disappear. It's like, like an evolutionary process in business. And yet, these are smart people. They know their industries. I came across a story. I did a master's here in the uh, University of Ulster. And uh, as part of the studies, I came across a really interesting uh, story about a group called Ice Harvesters. And back in the early 1800s, uh, it was uh, it was an industry where people would cut ice from lakes in Scandinavia or Canada and take the frozen blocks of ice and wrap them and ship them to New York or London or Paris. And it was a luxury item because obviously there would be meltage, but some would survive. It was a high value luxury item, big business. Fast forward 100 years to the invention of electricity and refrigeration. And somebody had the bright idea of building ice factories in cities. And they would have these ice factories in New York and Paris and London. And if you've ever seen movies from the era of the likes of The Godfather and you see the big burly guy carrying a block of ice on a, with a special kind of hook thing, they would have been cut from the ice factories. And then you fast forward maybe 30 years and you have refrigeration in restaurants and hotels and eventually in homes. The thing that I found interesting about this story was that I couldn't find an example of an ice factory company, of a nice harvesting company that became an ice harvest. <laughs> I couldn't find an example of an ice harvesting company that became an ice factory company, or an ice factory company that made refrigerators. They all just disappeared. Very interesting. You can look at other industries. Amtrak in the United States was a powerhouse of the industrial era the invention of the airplane, and they missed it because from their perspective, they were in the railway business, not the transport business. And people went, like Seth Godin said in his ideas that are worth spreading, people went with the idea that was catching on, which was how can I get from point A to point B much quicker than I would with the railway. And now, you know, it's still an interesting and romantic thing to take a train in North America, but by and large, I think they carry mostly freight. We could go through example after example. So we love to talk about innovation, and yet we've, some, we've far more examples of why we fail. So if it's fear, do organizations feel fear? Do societies feel fear? I would argue no. It's human beings that feel fear. And collectively, we can create a culture of something, be it change or be it inertia. So it's down to us as individual human beings. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is the role of leadership in this. I would argue that leaders, in order to create an environment uh, that will support uh, innovation, you need to have three things. You need to bring three things as a leader. And I think of it, and the way I remember it is CCG. You need to bring courage, you need to bring curiosity, and you need to bring generosity. Let's talk for a minute about why I think these three things. So courage, if we feel fear, and fear is the thing that can prevent us from moving forward, as leaders, we can't afford to fall into that trap. We've got to find a way, and by the way, when I say leaders, we can be leaders in any environment. You can be a leader in your family, you can be a leader in your education, you can be a leader even just as a member of a team. Because leaders cause things to happen. I saw a model some years ago where they say the lowest form of how we can interact with a stimulus is just to react. I pinch you, you, you jump. I'm the stimulus, you react, I'm in control. The next level of us in taking control is respond. So you see me coming to pinch you, I pinch you and you choose not to flinch. But eventually what we're trying to do is get up into the cause box, which is at the top 
And that's where leaders live. Leaders are not responding and reacting and responding and reacting. They're causing. So they understand what's going on. And they take a place or a stance on something and they cause change. And we can look at great leaders around the world. I mean, the obvious examples that everyone will know, like Gandhi or King or any of these people who've led very big change just by understanding what's going on, rising above the fear and taking a position. So courage is critical. Courage in leadership is everything. It's almost like in a, as a parent, if you have something that's worrying you and you have children, do you tell your children about all the things that are worrying you? Or do you take that burden on your shoulders and help your children not to feel the fear? And if there's something difficult to be dealt with, you'll help your children through that. In a way, leadership is kind of like being a parent. Because whoever we are working with, if we have people working for us, or if we're part of an organization that's depending on us, we have a charge. There are people in our charge, in our care. So we owe it to them that we will own our own fear and we will demonstrate courage. Courage is not feeling no fear. Courage is having the fear and rising above it. And that's what we as leaders need to do. The next piece then is curiosity. When I think about curiosity, it's an easy one to say, but you know, it's kind of what prevents us sometimes from having the curiosity is a little bit of the fear, but oftentimes it's that we've got a picture of the world. And one thing about human beings is that when they've made their mind up, they generally don't like to change it. Because if I decide to change my mind, the first thing I have to do is admit that what I thought was wrong. So I have to be able to admit to myself the position I held is no longer valid, or perhaps was never valid. That takes courage to be able to admit that for myself. But if I can do that and I can bring genuine curiosity, then I'm in a position to be able to understand what is new and what is happening and see it with clearer eyes. And the reason that this is critically important today in leadership is that we have never had such diversity in the workplace. To have curiosity, to be open to new ideas, is easy when we're surrounded by people that look like us and sound like us and have a similar background. But to be working with people who have a different perspective can be challenging. We all know the apocryphal story of the bad manager who goes and hires people that just like her or just like him. We've got to be the opposite to that. At the moment, we talk about Gen X and Gen Y. And particularly, there's a lot of focus on Gen Y. If you understand where this is going, just looking at US data, you've got to remember the baby boomers, who we forget to talk about mostly now, are still in the workplace. We've extended retirement years. We've also seen most of our pension funds take a, a bashing in the last few years with what's gone on in the global economy. So we're going to have a lot of people who are still in this baby boom a, a generation who are going to be working and working into their 70s, perhaps. We're going to have people who are Gen X. I'm Gen X. And lots of people who are Gen X working. And we've got Gen Y. And guess what? Gen Y are already in the workplace. The, key, the, the people who are in college now are Gen Z. So we already have three generations in the workplace, and we're going to have a fourth. It is unprecedented. I don't believe this has ever happened before in human history, that we've had four generations working in the workplace. So we've got generational diversity. The typical thing when we think about diversity is we think gender. So you look at a lot of organizations and you look at the statistics that they count when they're trying to think, are we a diverse organization? What's our balance of male and female? That's often where it is. In certain countries, it may be to do with color of skin, ethnicity, sometimes religion. There'll be, you know, those kind of things. Where it gets interesting, though, is when we start to look beneath the obvious things around diversity. What are the experiences that an individual might have that give them a unique position, or at the very least, a position that's different to me as a leader, or me as their teammate? And if I see them do something and look at it purely through my own lens, I'll miss it. I've done some research around Gen X and Gen Y in the workplace, and the reason I did this research was I found, and I did a lot of work with graduate recruits, and I found the Gen Y people coming into our workplace to be very enthusiastic, very egalitarian, uh, you know, very creative, really enthusiastic about coming to work. And yet when I heard Gen X people talk about them, what I heard was, gosh, those Gen Y people are really needy. And I found that fascinating because these Gen X people were, were good people and the Gen Y people were good people. There's just a disconnect. 
The way the Gen Y were showing up and the way the Gen X interpreted that, there was a mismatch. And in fact, it's not that they're needy, it's that they want to engage. Gen X grew up in a world when we were a smaller population. If you look at the US, you know, there were some 75 million baby boomers. Schools were built to accommodate these people. Roads, everything was built to accommodate a big generation. Gen X comes along and there's only 40 some million. So they're not as crammed into schools, they're not as socialized, plus computers start to appear in the bedrooms, plus they're in a, in a world where both parents are working and they're kind of latchkey kids. Baby boomers highly socialized, Gen X not socialized. Gen X comes into, baby boomers go into the world when the economies are booming. Gen X go into the world in the mid 80s, you know, with the Gordon Gecko world that we all came in to work in where greed is good, and we have this sense that we've got to look out for ourselves. Baby boomers come into the, or um, Gen Y come into the world, and if you look at US data, there's 88 million Gen Y, even more than the baby boomers. And they went into schools and, were, and, and, and environments that were meant eventually for our Gen X. So they became highly crammed together, highly socialized. And what's more, they grow up with a smartphone in their hand. They grow up with the internet, social media. They're always connected. So when they want to make a decision, they, you know, they'll put it on the internet, they'll put it on Facebook and say, anybody know a good place to go eat tonight? That's how they engage, that's how they make decisions. So when they show up in the workplace and the Gen X people look at them and say, gosh, they're needy. It's not that they're needy, it's just that they engage in a different way. So as a leader, we've got to bring our curiosity. So when you as a leader look at something and say, my God, that person's insane, stop. What they said might sound insane to you. So the onus, the responsibility for deliberately figuring out and interpreting the messages for you to say, that sounds crazy from my point of view. Doesn't mean it is crazy. So as a leader, I've got to start getting outside myself and connecting into them, and that's where curiosity comes in. WB Yeats, uh, forgive me if we've any li English literature scholars in the room as I butcher a poem by this wonderful man, but there's a piece in one of his poems where he said, how many have loved your glad grace? with love both false and true. But one man, one man loved the pilgrim soul in you. Very powerful. And in a world with so much diversity, with so much challenge, with such a fast pace of change, what we perhaps all want is to be appreciated and understood. How wonderful it would be for any of us to truly believe we were working in an environment where our leaders or our teammates took the time to understand the pilgrim soul in us. Because it is a pilgrimage. We are all gonna see change come faster and faster and faster. Like the ice harvesters, we have a choice. And the only way we can keep up with this is if we can engage ourselves on this pilgrimage and understand that we're gonna constantly evolve. And the last piece is generosity. So we've got courage, curiosity, and then generosity. And from a leadership perspective, while we go on this journey, it can be very private. There's a lot going on inside our heads and our hearts when we're on this pilgrimage. But one of the things we need as leaders is to be generous. We need to open that and share back because one of the things we have to do is to be able to be a beacon. You know, this is the courage piece. If we've overcome this, we can provide an example and give people permission to engage themselves on the pilgrimage. But it requires a generosity for, on our part because we have to take of ourselves and give out. I'll share a little experience with you uh, from my own point of view. Um, you know, we're talking here about bringing your humanity into your leadership ultimately because if we take the, all the different types of diversity that we have in the world and we draw an enormous Venn diagram, the one thing that's in the middle is we're all human beings. So if I want to be generous as a leader and connect on a human level, I've got to first of all connect to my own human inside me. So if I go back maybe 10 years, uh, 12 years, I, I, I would have been much more of an android. I was definitely a product of the 80s. I was in it for myself. I had this absolutely invincibility kind of cloak about me and I was powering through my career and it was working very well. And then I did a 360 feedback. 
And I found something very interesting. In this, this 360 feedback process, I got feedback from over 30 people. Peers, people working for me, my boss, customers. And I was amazed to find one word coming up again and again. And that word was scary. In different forms, but often that word. And when your boss is even saying, you're a bit scary, you probably have something to think about. So I asked myself, do I want to be scary? It had worked quite well for me up until that point, and my career was going very nicely. And I decided I didn't want to be scary, because I kind of didn't like that idea. I didn't want to have that effect on the world. And being very pragmatic, if I wanted to grow my career to running large organizations, how effective would I be if I had multiple levels in an organization and even the people working with me were afraid to come to me? What were my opportunities of benefiting from all the diversity in there and drawing up the ideas? You know, on one, sir, on one point, it looks smart because you're in control, but it's not really smart. It's like someone said to me earlier, it's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. Wisdom is knowing you don't put it in a fruit salad. Right? And it can be subtle, but I made this decision and I went on this journey. And I am here to tell you today that if you, if you embark on this, the challenge for you is that you have to first take off your armor. We all in our lives with different experiences put armor on. And if we choose to engage in this process, we can't continue, we, if we keep the same armor, we will engage in the same way. Because no matter what we're doing in, th in terms of what we're saying, people will observe that our defense mechanisms are the same. So the first piece we have to do is take off the armor. When you take off the armor, you're vulnerable. And depending on how long your pilgrimage takes, you can be vulnerable for a while. But what will ultimately happen to you is that you won't need any armor. When I went on this journey, I was some months into it, and I was really trying. And as you can imagine, having been scary, there were people lying in wait for me when I stopped being scary. The other thing that happened was my mother was killed in a road accident. That was very hard to take. There was a huge temptation to put the armor back on, because with the armor, I knew exactly how to deal with these crises. People around me, including my wife, who really didn't want me to be scary, <laughs> encouraged me to stay on the journey, and I did. And it's so worth it. If you get there in the end, you don't, need the, you don't need the armor because you know how to handle the fear is gone. If you've grown up in a world where people walk and throw shapes, if you've, if you've lived in a tough environment, you'll know that there are people who walk around and they try to make themselves look big and strong and dangerous. The people who do that are, are the most frightened. They are the most frightened because they're projecting all the time, don't mess with me because I'm afraid you might mess with me. But real leaders, they're not afraid, and they don't have to do that. And because there's no armor, they can really, truly engage with some generosity. So I'll leave you with that. Courage, curiosity, generosity. I wish you luck on your pilgrimage, and maybe I'll meet you on the road. Thank you.